today's talk really is to get a better understanding of what digital forensics is, the role it could play within organisations, and demystifying some of the methodologies and the tools. I think there is a generally held principle that digital forensics is quite a costly and expensive process to undertake. And in part, it is. But in other parts, it isn't. And actually, there are some pros and cons of, of acquiring and utilising um, digital forensics. It's worth just talking about what digital forensics is and, and to get a kind of a, a frame of reference, so to speak. So um, it's first to comment, fair to comment, firstly, that computer forensics is pretty much the bread and butter of, of digital forensic activities. If you were to speak to the high-tech crime units about what they do, they probably spend most of the time, 80 90% of their activities, focused upon the acquisition and analysis of hard drive media. Okay, and most of the tools and the procedures I'm talking about today really do actually map back to the analysis of computer-based media. There are other three other kind of subcategories of digital forensics that are gaining increasing focus. Um, the second is mobile phone forensics. Um, for obvious reasons, we all have these mobile devices, therefore we want to understand what people are doing on them. Network forensics. This actually picks off some, some work that I'm going to finish today's presentation when I start talking about anti-forensics. And the reality is, unfortunately, as computer forensics goes, we're beginning to have less reliance upon just locating and believing the evidence we're finding on individual machines. We have to start uh, casting the, the net wider, so to speak. So network forensics provides the opportunity for us in doing that. And then the final category is embedded forensics. And this capitalizes on the, the idea that actually anything that can store information whether that be your video recorder, your washing machine, potentially has the opportunity of having evidence that might, um, might, might, uh, might be the evidence you're looking for to refute a claim or, or something else. So, for instance, um, a, a washing machine being switched on at a particular time of day might be the evidence required to say this person was, in fact, in his home at that point in time. He switched the washing machine on, and there's a time date stamp to prove that. As I say, for us, primarily what we're focusing upon today is computer-based forensics. Most of the methodologies, most of the procedures do, to varying shapes and sizes, map onto those other disciplines as well. So a bit of an overview of, of the talk. I'm going to start talking about um, the importance of forensic capability within organizations, why it might be useful for you guys to, to um, incorporate these processes and procedures. I'm then going to break down the, the process of forensics into two, acquisition which is very, very important in terms of making sure what you find has any value whatsoever. And then also examination and analysis, and that's the, the bit that actually goes and looks at this data to try to find evidence of misuse or, or anything else. The reason why I broke these two, two different aspects down is because acquisition is actually a relatively cheap thing to do. There's actually very little software cost, hardware cost in acquisition. All of the costs, and whenever you, if you've ever been quoted for forensic software, all of the costs really are in the, the second aspect, the examination and analysis aspect. But in there, we don't actually have to use forensic software. There are a variety of other tools and open source tools we can actually use. The forensics bit, the bit that provides preservation of data and integrity of data, is all to do with the acquisition. And there are free tools that enable, allow us to do that. I'm then going to finally talk about two other aspects of the digital forensics pro process. Um, proactive forensics, so what can organizations do in order to help the incident response and forensic activity? There are things we can do from an architectural perspective to actually aid the, the, the response um, procedure. And then finally, I'll talk about anti-forensics. Excuse me a moment. Unfortunately, like any other security discipline, you, know, you create a security control, a, a security countermeasure, or indeed in this, time, in this reference, an uh, uh, analysis tool to examine, then you have a whole new field come about that tries to exploit that and, and, and change the data you're looking at. And unfortunately, anti forensics come about um, that does exactly that. And I'll talk about some techniques um, in that area as well. Okay, so to kick off with, the importance of digital forensics. I could have, on this slide, put a whole load of kind of business-related jargon talking about um, the impact upon the business line, the, the, the bottom of the business, the impact upon reputation um, if digital forensics isn't actually utilised. I decided not to do that because I think we all understand our businesses, we all understand the risks, and we understand how to mitigate them and, and deal with them and what might have an effect upon them. So what I wanted to do is point out some of the other kind of aspects that are specific to digital forensics. And the first one here, I've said ineffectual response. And what I mean by this is without a digital forensics procedure, how do you manage incidents? Okay. You might have techniques, for instance, that should an incident be flagged or reported that you go in, you start examining the systems, whether it be servers or indeed workstations, that that incident's actually happened. The point at which you start doing that, if you're not deploying or employing a, a forensic methodology, then the value 
of what you're doing diminishes significantly. Yes, for sure, through that procedure, you can identify what the issue was and hopefully rectify it and make sure it doesn't happen again. So if it were a piece of malware, you can make sure that however the malware got in, you blocked it up for the next time. If it were employee misuse, then obviously you can make sure that what, what he's done um, and, and tell him off for doing it. But beyond that, there's not much more you can do because you're having an impact upon the data. The integrity of that data no longer holds true. You couldn't invite the police in to examine these systems because your system administrator has been all over them. He's changing all of the data. So there's no criminal proceedings that can be um, processed from there. Civil proceedings become more difficult. This is primarily because as forensics become more well established, courts expect and tribunals and other, and other um, um, environments expect data in a certain way. They would expect data in a forensic fashion. So if you're not employing these, these forensic methodologies, then what we tend to find is actually there's very little we can do after that. We can't do anything with this evidence we find. And the problem we have with digital forensics is you don't always understand the scale and nature of the incident until actually it's been analysed. So it's too late to actually start analysing the problem and then find out, oh, well, actually, this has cost us hundreds of thousands, millions of pounds. What can we do about it? At this point, you've impacted upon the data. There is very little you can do about it other than obviously make sure it doesn't happen again. I've suggested, I've said about acceptance by civil and criminal courts, employment tribunals now. Um, I was chatting to the, the manager of the high-tech crime unit only last week, and he was chatting about he's seeing organisations now more and more providing data to them in a forensic fashion already. <coughs> okay, they've already gone through a process called imaging, which, which requires the data, and actually they understand how to deal with this data. They make sure their system admins don't start trawling all across the data and modifying it. It ticks a due, dil due diligence box to make sure from a, a practice perspective that you actually understand through an incident response procedure how digital forensics fits in and how actually you, you manage your systems and manage that response process. More and more, as the tool and the tools you use within digital forensics, it actually enables more timely analysis of data. So historically, again, lots of people have a perception of digital forensics being a massively time-consuming process. And again, that's not completely untrue. Acquisition, that I'll talk about a little bit later, is a very time-consuming process. But the analysis of data, the forensics tools we have now can cut down on that analysis, can help identify relevant artefacts a lot, lot quicker than a manual analysis of the system. Importantly, of course, it allows integrity and repeatability. And that's why we, we, um, we use digital forensics. We can understand that this evidence, whether it be on a hard drive or a server, we can present that evidence to anybody we'd like, and they can repeat that same procedure we've carried out to find that same evidence. Without a forensics methodology or framework, then effectively that's no longer possible because you're changing the live data on the system. So I don't mean to talk too much about the academic basis, but the reason why I wanted to point out the methodology was to highlight the difference between acquisition and examination. Now, it's worth noting for the moment, digital forensics is a very, very new domain compared to many other aspects of information security. One of the underlying frameworks for digital forensics was developed back in 2001. So what are we talking about, 12 years ago? So in comparison to others, it's still finding its feet. It's still trying to understand, actually, what the methodologies are. And if you've ever done any work in this space, what you tend to find is each organization, each even high-tech crime unit and police law enforcement agency tend to have their own methodologies that have been adopted based upon what their actual requirements are. They do, however, all pretty much encompass at least these three aspects. Because in the end, if you think about forensics, we need to acquire the, 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 the data, the raw data. We need to do some processing of that data. And then finally, typically, we need to report it in some fashion or some form. As I say, I'm going to pick up the, the two boxes here, acquisition and examin examination. So what's acquisition all about? It's about preservation of data. Okay? Now, the key bit to remember here is things change. There are two scales. I'm going to give you the ideal perspective, and then you guys working your operations in your organizations are going to understand actually that's not necessarily feasible. Okay? So the ideal gold standard in many respects in, in digital forensics is if an incident happened, you'd come along, you'd physically acquire the drive or the drives, and then you'd physically um, acquire them. Okay? What I mean by this is every bit of the hard drive you'd acquire. So this is not a backup copy. This is not a file copy you just grab along from a booted system. You literally use a piece of software with a hardware write blocker, and you capture every single zero and one for the whole of the drive. It sounds perfectly feasible when you talk about typical cases that law enforcement are involved in. A computer, I'm surfing something I shouldn't be surfing. There's a hard drive in here. They can extract the hard drive out and then copy it. 
In organizational settings, this becomes a little bit more tricky. If you're talking about some kind of network share, then it becomes more difficult. Operationally, these are 24-7 appliances. How do you go about acquiring data? It's worth also pointing out, just to give you an idea of the time frames we're talking about. Um, a one and a half terabyte drive across USB 2 will take about 12 hours to acquire. So this isn't a short period of time. Okay. With acquisition, we also need to make sure documentation and chain in custody. Okay, so documenting basically every procedure we're doing, photographing what you're doing. And this helps ma maintain and provide that should you decide at point end along this process that actually law enforcement do need to get involved or your lawyers need to get involved for some civil litigation or indeed um, you want to take it to an employment tribunal, then you can make sure you've got the, the necessary paperwork to follow that up. With acquisition, there's also something called the order of volatil volatility to consider. And this is the, the, the problem of the, the data on the, the computer itself um, changes all of the time. So when it comes to actually acquiring that data, you need to give some thought to what you're going to acquire first and the process by which you're going to acquire it. So ideally, you know, we don't want to change any data. In reality, that's almost impossible. As soon as I'm sat here, that the computers that are running this presentation, thousands of bits are changing continuously. So it's very, very difficult to, to, to pinpoint a time. But typically, what we're talking about here is actually grabbing the RAM contents first, then doing analysis for certain network protocols that are open, IPs that are talking, presence of any botnets, for instance, communications. And then one of the final pieces we, we then go to acquire is the hard drive itself. That's the least volatile of, of all of the memory locations. And we do have a range of different options here. You know, again, as I said, the ideal situation is we acquire the full, of the full hard drive. But actually, there's a variety of other scenarios. You know, if you want to do some covert, you're, you're, you suspect, for instance, an employee perhaps is um, leaking sensitive files. You don't have time for full disk encryption, uh, sorry, for full disk acquisition. There are tools based on USB keys that you can simply come along at a lunchtime, plug it into his computer with a second USB hard drive to push the files onto. And it will go off and acquire, for instance, all of the my documents, all the internet surfing activity and other sensitive files automatically for you. So there's no user interaction whatsoever. Very much depends upon what you're trying to achieve and what you're looking to do. Again, the gold standard would suggest you need some kind of hardware write blocker. So from an acquisition process, it's very important. You know, typically, if you've been to the high-tech crime units and law enforcement, they will always seek to extract the hard drive from the system if possible and physically attach it to a hardware write blocker to make sure that the integrity and preservation of data is always maintained. Um, these pieces of kit are quite expensive, and there are software versions of them that are existing, and there are other modes of which you can acquire the data um, that, that provides a, a similar level of, of effectiveness. It's also a relatively time-consuming process, as I, said, as I said before, which has some very strong implications for operations. The key part about acquisition, however, is the software is free. Okay, it doesn't actually cost you anything. And the reason why I've gone through some of the, the considerations that you need to bear in mind here is, is because actually beyond that, you guys could train and have expertise within the organization that can actually forensically acquire the data. Okay. Once you've got the data in a forensics fashion, we can pretty much then start thinking about dropping the forensics aspect. Because once you have data in a read-only fashion, you can't change it. You've got your chain of custody um, sewn up. You can do anything you like to that data. The actual original hard drive you've copied from gets put in a safe. Whoops. Gets put in a safe, locked away, never touched again, and you're dealing with this image of the original data. Okay? And as I said, the, the reason why I differentiate between the two is because the costs involved in training and maintaining that training for a digital forensic examiner, maintaining the software licenses for the forensic software, all comes in the second phase, in examination and analysis of that image itself. Now, I don't wish to suggest that you don't need the software in that sense. I'm just looking to present arguments for why actually forensics doesn't have to be such an expensive process that perhaps it is today. Um, certainly if you've ever um, asked for, for costs on, on getting forensic activity done by third parties. When it comes to examination analysis, there are some very real advantages of using the software, particularly the, the two primary pieces of software that I'll talk about in a second. They offer a range of functionality that really do um, diminish the time taken to analyze a drive. Okay. Now, it's worth pointing out the, the types of functionality I'm going to be talking about in the next few slides. It ranges depending upon the products you're buying. So what I've extracted here is, is what's generally available with, with the main key pieces of commercial software. Um, you have to obviously have to analyze the software yourself depending upon what, what it is you're looking to achieve. The key bit with forensic software is it allows a dead analysis. Okay, and that's the key concept to get over. 
We have dead and live. What I mean by live is the system's actually booted. So the suspect machine, you've taken an image from it, you've got a hard drive of that image, and you put it back into the computer. So it's not the original hard drive, that's in the safe. And you decide to boot from it. Why do you do that? Well, you do that because you want the operating system to interpret the information for you. Okay? You want it, for instance, to boot so that you can understand the configuration information. You want it to boot so you can easily read the registry to find out what he's been installing and what he's been doing, to read the most recently used lists, to find what applications he's got installed. Okay? Live analysis allows you to do that. The problem with live analysis, which hopefully now I've given you a, a 101 on acquisition, should be raising alarm bells. As soon as I boot, the data's changing. I've lost preservation and integrity of data. So therefore, you need to understand what's changing and why it's changing. And that's a quite difficult thing to do, which is why, wherever possible, we always stay in the dead space. And what the dead space does is say, here's the image. It's a pile of zeros and ones, relatively large pile usually, and our tools inspect this data. And they inspect it in a read-only fashion. So the, ch the data itself never changes. Now, if you think about that, hopefully you, you begin to appreciate that's not such an easy task. Now, what I'm asking is, rather than the operating system from a live analysis, booting, understanding the file system, recreating the file system for you, my forensic software has to understand the file system. It needs to be able to recreate the folder file tree that you see. It needs to understand the applications you're using, the registry files, the configuration information. And that pretty much underpins, for instance, why, one of the reasons why forensic software costs money, that these processes are not easy for the forensic software to do. So the forensic tools, as I say, great for dead analysis and for um, reducing the complexity of the analysis that you're undertaking. It's worth pointing out that the two primary pieces of software, NCASE and FTK, now allow you to do a pseudo live analysis. So what that means is within the forensic software itself, you can effectively mount the drive and do various other pieces of functionality, but it still maintains preservation of data by effectively caching any changes that you want rather than actually writing to the drive. And again, it does this for a variety of different reasons. Um, largely, one of the biggest reasons is bespoke applications. So if we think about, for instance, if I use the examples of email and internet, for instance, they create proprietary files that store your data. Now, with any general piece of software, like email clients and like internet browsers, the forensic software providers can provide passes to understand that data and extract it for you. For bespoke applications, they're not going to have those passes. They're not going to know what bespoke applications you guys have um, in your organizations. So you might need to use an application that's on that computer in order to recreate and understand that information. The other bit with, with forensic tools is effectively when booting a system, there are certain things you can't do. So for instance, when booting a system in a, dead, uh, in a live analysis, the operating system will ignore deleted files. It will not let you get access to certain system files. It will not let you access certain registry files. Forensic software simply ignores all of this. It gives you back all this information. If there are deleted files still contained within the, the, the file system itself, it will mark these up and show you which ones have been deleted if possible, also give you access to those files. Whether it can give you access or not very much depends upon the state of the operating system, and, sorry, the state of the file system as to whether that, those data clusters have been rewritten. But effectively, it, it will try to give you access to the information. It also has functionality that highlights simple data hiding techniques built in. So something called file signature analysis. This is an approach, um, the, the old approach, um, Thinking uh, child pornography, for instance, is, is unfortunately one of the biggest problems that law enforcement have. And it's one of the main reasons why they do a lot of digital-based forensics. Um, the the high-tech crime unit here, Devon and Cornwall, we are a big part of their business, unfortunately, is that. So the forensic tools themselves are orientated towards what, what law enforcement have traditionally needed. And one of the ways people try to circumvent that kind of detection is simply changing the extension of the file. So away from JPEG or GIF or, or bitmap to text or to doc with the mind of thinking, well, if the system's not reporting it as an image, then my forensic examiner's not going to be able to find it. And, and obviously, using forensic software, that's not the case at all. It, it ignores the extension and actually just looks at the header information. Okay? And indeed, the forensic software will, will throw up any flags where the, the extension's not matching the header, because obviously it's an opportunity for someone circumventing um, that detection. It also allows you to recover recycle bin records. I'm not just talking about the current recycle bin. I'm talking about recycle bins you've emptied. There might be historical records of info, two records stored in there. Hidden folders is another technique. Um, quite often you'd be amazed, but quite often in literature you'll find people, if they hide it 14, 15, 20 folders down, nobody's going to bother looking, looking through the tree 14 times. Again, there's functionality built in the software that simply ignores that, and, and you can look into the folders and inspect all the data either at once or, or subsections of it. 
The forensic software also allows for data reduction. So if you think about it, you've got a, a hard drive with, with 100,000 files. That's a lot of information to be, to be canvassing through. There are known data sets, actually for both good and bad files. Not so easy for organizations to get hold of the bad files. They tend to be the data sets of child pornography, for instance, that they're limited um, to, to law enforcement and other organizations. But the good files are. So the NSRL, the National Software Reference Library, is an organization in the US that provides a, a data set of all known applications and every file. They're all hashed, which means you can import it into the forensic software and reduce your 100,000 files probably down to about 20,000 files. So a huge kind of reduction in, in the analysis um, process. Outside of the file system and, and, and those processes, forensic software also allows you to do something called data carving, which again allows you to get access to data that you'd never be able to get through live analysis. Okay, it simply ignores the file system and will go through literally the zeros and ones looking for particular signatures of files. Okay, and wherever it finds them, it basically grabs them, pulls that data out, carves that data out, and you have your images. Just an example, I, I've just put a, hopefully a couple of images up here to give you an idea. Now the advantages of this, so the file system no longer has any record of this data. Your live system analysis would never give you this data. It's only through a forensics process of data carving that would actually gain access to this data. There are some pros and cons. On the left hand side, it's an example of where it's data carved a full image. But on the right hand side, it's a suggestion where it's having problems. And actually, data carving, particularly advanced data carving, is an active area of research because we've got things like fragmentation, okay, and other issues that mean the data is not stored in consecutive clusters, which makes it difficult to retrieve back from us. If you think about what I'm talking about data carving, there's no metadata associated with that file anymore. So we don't know where it's stored. We don't know what it's called necessarily. The file system no longer has any knowledge of it, but we're able to re-piece this from file headers and other signatures in the data. Interestingly, what we can see from this particular image is actually this image is still part of this, this image. We can see kind of if we look at the door here, it's offset, it's a different color but it roughly constitutes a similar kind of frame around here. And again, this bottom image, we've got a light source down here, we've got another one here, and some text that roughly pertains to this. So basically what's happened is we're, li we're missing some data, and therefore the, the JPEG view in this particular case is misunderstood and, and then just formatted what it can actually see. Okay. But data carving for us, um, once the file system has lost that evidence, it is the key process by which we can understand what else was previously stored on the drive based on the assumption that people tend to delete what they don't want to be found. And obviously, this is a key process for us for retrieving it. Forensic processes also do a variety of other things for us. Pattern matching, credit cards, and other information. Any pattern you could think of, the system would be able to find it immediately. Indexing. Um, there's been a change in the methodology of how these analysis software works. So previously, you used to come along, you analyze um, the software, you used to put in some search terms. So I want to search for Steve Fennell through this case. So you type in his name, click go, then you'd go off for a cup of tea, probably go off for lunch. If you were lucky, you'd get the result before tea, otherwise you'd have to come back the following morning, because it could, took a long time to process through the case. Both the main commercial providers now do pre-indexing up front, pre-processing up front. You provide a selection of options, you let it go, you still have to come back probably the following day to get the results, but you get one set of results that hit, and with indexing in particular, you no longer have to keep doing these repeated searches for keywords and terms. They come up immediately because they can create a database of indexed terms. The software supports a variety of communication technologies, email clients, web browsers, to understand what people are doing. Obviously, typically in law enforcement, it's a very important um, area. As I said, there is a focus on image-based analysis. Um, forensic software, some of them at least, include password cracking opportunities. Um, password recovery toolkit is one of the leading um, pieces of software for, for um, cracking passwords of all types, of office documents, or of Windows systems, and so on and so forth. And they've got a rather interesting way of doing it through creating word lists but from the hard drive itself. Finally, also reporting. And this is a key phase. I'm going to talk about the tools very quickly now. The top two are called case management tools, and they try to do everything from acquisition analysis to reporting. Okay, and the key part, how these guys revolutionized the domain, was prior to this, Forensic examiners had to use 20, 30 different tools. They get results from each of them, and then they have to spend the time compiling the report of all of the evidence and all the artifacts of what they found and where they found them. Now this is all housed within a single piece of software. The problem, or disadvantage potentially, is obviously the price associated to them. Bearing in mind, certainly NCASE already now comes with a service charge on top, an annual service charge. Um, FTK, Access Data's FTK, doesn't currently, but I'm pretty sure they will very soon. Um, 
In terms of the forensics domain commercially, th these guys pretty much have it sewn up. They, they represent, I, I would suggest, you know, 95, 98% of the market. Law enforcement would use one of those two products almost ubiquitously, um, or indeed both of them, um, universally, sorry. X-ray forensics, Internet Evidence Finder, there are other tools that come along. In, Internet Evidence Finder is a particularly um, favoured one by law enforcement in this country. As you see, they all come with relative costs, and this doesn't include, obviously, the staff costs for training. These are five-day courses, you've got to send people away. These courses also have to be updated so with every new Windows operating system or Mac operating system come new file systems, a new understanding of how the forensics actually works, therefore new training requirements. So this by far isn't the only cost involved within the forensics process. The good news, however, is a whole load of software, sorry, a whole load of open source options for you as well. Now for you guys, because you're not law enforcement, you're not automatically wanting to take it to a court or civil action. The key part, as I mentioned before, is acquisition is done in a, in a forensically sound fashion. The analysis can be done with whatever tool you want. In this particular sense, whatever tool worked with the forensic image you've acquired. Okay. And here are some options. There are plenty of them. I've just mentioned some of the more favoured ones. Autopsy is actually the front end to a back end kit called the Sleuth Kit, developed by Brian Carrier a few years ago. Now it's a very, very powerful kit that works with NTFS. Um, the Digital Forensics Framework is, is a, uh, an interesting project. It, it's been going for a few years. It's about adaptability, so it's actually increasing in the functionality it can provide every day. And also SANS provide a free toolkit for you to download. And effectively, what SANS do, as with other security distribution tools, if you've ever come across them, Backtrack for instance, is effectively try to compile all of the open source tools that exist within Forensics for you to use. And these are all free. They all find the evidence. If at point N you decide you do want criminal proceedings or civil, then you can always empl employ somebody to come along and use NCASE on this. But the key point here is you can use free tools to analyse the drive to find if there's anything there before then taking the, the next step, which is the more costly step of actually analysing it formally with the tools. I say this because typically the analysis, particularly in a court scenario, they, they tend to like analysis being performed by commercial tools. There's a lack of trust of the evidence being provided through open source. Just because open source is open source, you know, there's no trustworthy um, um, background to it. You can change the code in open source and who knows what you're changing it to and, and what the outputs are, whether they're still true. But there are a variety of tools out there that do all of that. Now, the last couple of areas, hopefully I've still got a bit of time, that I wanted to talk about. Hopefully, just going back, sorry, that's giving you an idea of kind of acquisition and, ex and uh, examination what you can do about it, and what tools are available to do that. Um, proactive forensics is all about the pre-planning. What can you do from an organizational perspective to help aid an incident response process? Now, if we think about with proactive forensics, the cost, the, one of the primary costs after the software, it is your analysts themselves. It's the training required in understanding. Um, it's worth pointing out, again, from an organizational perspective, by and large, Point and click forensic analysts are perfectly fine. These are the guys that understand how software works, can point and click, push it to the right image, and search it, but does not necessarily understand what the software is doing, it, why it's doing it, and where it's found the results from. Okay. Once you want to take it a little bit further into civil or criminal litigation, you do need someone to understand where those results have come from. You need to go a little bit further. And, and that's quite a costly training exercise, that that is sending someone away to a lot of courses and getting a, a fundamental academic understanding of what digital forensics is actually about how NTFS works, so on and so forth. From our perspective, from an organizational perspective, if you're able to minimize your operational characteristics, so for instance, you only run Microsoft Windows, okay? you only run a particular version of Microsoft Windows, therefore, you're no longer having to support, from a forensics perspective, three or four different platforms with different file systems, you've now only got the one file system. So you have the one training course to send the guy on, rather than three or four. If you enable comprehensive logging on all the systems, from a forensics perspective, you have a, a far richer environment of information to better understand what's going on. We also need to think about the actual systems you're, you're um, using and to make sure they're actually supported and match up with the forensic software you plan to use. I um, had a recent example in the university. So, so one of the things we do, we, we, we provide the digital forensic services to the university, um, primarily actually in the area of data recovery at the moment. And a guy came along with a, uh, a NAS, network attached storage, we took a RAID configuration on, he said, one of my researchers just deleted two gigs off this. Can you get it back? And unfortunately, the answer to that was no, because they had a particular type of RAID on there that neither NCASE or FTK supported. So there was no way we can actually get hold of them. Well, we can acquire the data, but there's no way in which we can analyze the data to retrieve it afterwards. 
We also need to give some prior thoughts to the uh, acquisition considerations. I, I'd rather simply said to you, you know, it requires no training. It's a piece of software. You plug it together, click, click, and it acquires the data. Okay, it takes 12 hours to do it, but it does acquire it. There are some nuances about that. You know, we need to give consideration to the hard drive types, the different types of connector, and, and, and the, the forensics machine which you're going to acquire it on. Um, to give an example, for instance, the RAID guy that came along, it was an uh, 8-terabyte NAS. So one of the problems I had originally is, where do I have 8 terabytes to store this image on? <coughs> or in fact, actually 3 or 4 terabytes, because it would be a compressed file. So I needed to make sure I had the, the, the network storage of my own to, to place this forensic image on in order to be able to do the analysis. And again, like any incident planning, you need to make sure all the appropriate policies and procedures are put in place beforehand to make sure that actually when the incident does happen, you've got an effective team and process in place to actually manage that. Now, hopefully, I've portrayed a relatively positive outlook for digital forensics. Um, I, I've suggested it, you know, it is an approach. If you want to do anything with, with what you find with any incident, it is a process you need to give some consideration to. It's also worth highlighting that there are kind of some, some dawning issues with forensics that are coming about. And I say dawning because, well, we're seeing a bit of the first two, but we're not really seeing much of the third and fourth. And I'll, I'll talk about each in turn. Data hiding, hopefully, if I put it in another term, encryption is something we all know about. Encryption is actually only one data hiding technique. Whilst as a security practitioner, I put a hat on saying encryption's great. From a forensics perspective, it's the exact opposite. It's a complete nightmare if you can't decrypt the stuff because there's nothing you can analyze. Okay. There are some other issues within data hiding. There are other techniques. Steganography is a technique, particularly in law enforcement. It's the, the security services are particularly worried about. That, that's where you hide images, uh, sorry, hide information in other carriers and other images and data. You don't even know it's there. At least with encrypted data, you know it's there and it's encrypted. With steganography, you don't actually know there's any covert information whatsoever. With artifact wiping, um, these are the tools that can come along and purport to wipe your internet browsing activity, for instance. So if you've been surfing during your lunchtime on websites you shouldn't be surfing, these are the tools that you come along, you wipe it, and therefore your organization never knows that you went to that particular site or were doing that surfing. Um, worth pointing out, th these tools do exist. Um, most of them, if you're not paying for them, tend to leave fingerprints around. So from a forensic analyst perspective, you can usually understand that someone's been using these tools, and that in itself would, would give us some information that perhaps they're doing something they shouldn't be, because they're using tools to, to, to hide and invade uh, what they're actually doing. But it's worth highlighting what these are. Trail obfuscation is about um, misleading, an investigator misleading your system admin in terms of what you're doing on the system. So to give you an example, I talked about file signature analysis earlier where I said we ignore the extensions, we just look at the header information. Okay? There is an app out there called Transmogrify that will modify the header information as well. So as far as the forensic software is concerned, that is indeed a document, that is indeed a temporary file, it is not an image. Whereas obviously the person who owns the system knows it is an image and can just right click and open with and open up in a, a, a viewer. Um, there's another one called, uh, oh no, I've forgotten it now. Yeah, sorry, forgotten the second one. But trail obfuscation is a bit of a worry. Basically, it's understanding the forensic procedures and modifying the data that's actually not so easy. The second one I was going to talk about, whose app I've forgotten, basically modifies the MAC times. So again, a lot of the work we do is understanding the incident from a chronology perspective. The timestamps of particular files being opened and closed. This particular app can come along and modify those to whatever you like. So it becomes very, very difficult for an investigator to understand what the series of steps actually were. And also the, the tools themselves. Again, this is just theoretical in the sense of being demonstrated theoretically. I don't know of any practical examples, but the forensic tools are pieces of software. They have vulnerabilities, and therefore they are susceptible to particular pieces of malware that might affect them. You would hope that your forensics lab is developed in such a way that it's not open to the internet. It's not open to the types of malware that we typically see with internet-connected PCs. But nevertheless, it is a concern um, to make sure that actually the outputs these tools are giving us are indeed correct. They're not hiding information. They're not misreporting information to us. So to summarize, I think I'm coming up to the end. Um, you, any form of incident response, really, or incident management, you must apply some form of forensic methodology from the very beginning of the process if you actually want to make sure that you can do anything about it, other than, obviously, making sure it doesn't happen again. Okay. Forensic acquisition is essential, and it's relatively cheap doesn't require a lot of training, doesn't require a lot of expertise, does require a bit of time, but then you can just let the process go overnight. It's not a big deal. It doesn't require somebody who's sat there wait, waiting for this, this status bar to be progressing through. Proactive planning and training will enable a, a more timely response. There is a question that I've kind of avoided in-house versus outsourced trade-off in, in terms of how you actually do this. 
I think hopefully I've put an argument for acquisition actually being relatively straightforward for any organization to undertake. The examination analysis is perhaps somewhere where you want to start thinking about bringing out source resources if you have a, a team where the, the, the cost benefit analysis just doesn't uh, dictate you know, training somebody up to do the analysis itself. The point to kind of pick out is an incredibly fast paced domain. Um, as you might imagine, technology changing all the time. But if you think about just not just technology, but the operating systems and the file systems, having someone updated, trained, and making sure the tools are there to actually do the job, it's not a cheap thing to do. So, uh, yeah. That was almost the end. What I wanted to point out is just a little bit of stuff that we're doing here in Plymouth, basically. Um, something called the E Centre Project, which is England's cybercrime centre of excellence for training, research, and teaching. And this is an EU funded project of we're just one of the partners, really. Um, and the idea in time is to provide a central repository. Now, primarily, it was motivated towards law enforcement and, and a need for them to start to better understand how to do digital forensics on a wider scale, just rather than the specialised HTCUs. But there's absolutely no reason why, from an organisational perspective, you don't capitalise upon this information as well. And in time, there will be uh, master classes on there, there will be um, tools on there, and other resources for, to which you can actually um, download and acquire. There is a, a secure part of this system, which is only open to law enforcement, but the idea is, by and large, the majority of it should be open source and to the open community that we can all access. Um, Plymouth University is acting as the, the, the regional hub. And I'm actually, just on the side here, this is a bit of where I'm trying to get your input. Um, we're currently undertaking a gap analysis to better understand from a regional perspective what digital forensics is currently being done. So if any of you guys are, are interested in kind of um, having a chat to me and talk to me about what you're doing and what you're not doing perhaps, in order for me to better understand how we could help, then that would be great. And my credentials for contacting me are here. Thank you very much.